very much for turning out on a Monday evening in this uh, slightly cold weather. This unfortunately is the final of our Goldrum lectures for this semester. However, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Zaletta Christofarwe, who will be doing the final presentation. Zaletta's specialism is in late 20th century and early 21st century North American and British fiction. She is also a fine member of our teaching team. For tonight's presentation, she will be working on I Don't Believe in the Future, I Think We're All Doomed, which um, is rather prescient, actually. Um, the Contemporary Apocalyptic Imagination. Deletta. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's great to see so many people here. It might be, as I was kind of saying, the current political climate that might be influencing this presence. But anyway, so polit politics aside, one of the starting points of this lecture uh, is that ours is a culture which is very, very much obsessed with the apocalypse. So that the apocalyptic imagination is thriving in this historical, social, and obviously political conjuncture. Um, so what I will do in this lecture is to explore the contemporary apocalyptic imagination with a focus on post-apocalyptic novels. And so I want to start by thinking about the quotation, uh, which is on the slide. This is not me, um, but it's Douglas Copeland, who is a contemporary Canadian novelist. Um, and this quotation comes from a novel, J-Pod, which is actually not about the apocalypse at all. Um, so it's a novel about a team of video game programmers whose name um, all begin with the letter J. So Copeland, as I was saying, is a Canadian writer, but also a visual artist, and um, here uh, he is on the slide with one of his artworks. And he's most famous as a novelist for his first novel, which is Generation X, published in 1991, which popularized the term Generation X. So Copeland is very much interested in the idea of the contemporary, in what it means to be living in the late 20th century and 21st century. And so the artwork on the slide is called Slogans for the 21st Century. And so through these slogans, Copeland seeks to capture the essence of the contemporary. And this is an essence which is very much intertwined with the apocalypse. So slogans like iPhones and Muji clothing won't protect you from what's coming, World War III seems so far away as to make it weirdly inevitable. Or if sentence emerges, don't expect it to like us very much. So all these slogans have this ominous apocalyptic quality that reflects the pronouncement in J-Pod that we are all doomed. So what the presence of this kind of quotation in a text like J-Pod, so a text which is not concerned with the apocalypse at all, um, frames is that this lack of belief in the future is widespread. So the apocalypse is all around us. It's all around us in novels, which I will discuss in the rest of this lecture, but it's around us in movies as well. And so some examples on the slide. In video games, but also in ads. Oops, there you go. Dramatic effect. <laughs> Um, and in the news as well. But what exactly is the apocalypse? What do we mean with this notion and what is its history? So apocalypse in popular parlance means an unprecedented catastrophe of devastating proportions and consequences. So much so that when we think of an apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic movie or novel, we think of a narrative which deals with the end of the world as we know it and the aftermath of such a catastrophic event. But catastrophe, end of the world, these are not the etymological meanings of apocalypse. Apocalypse comes from the Greek apokalyptein and etymologically means revelation. And you may recall at this point that the most fundamental Christian apocalyptic text is the Apocalypse of John, which is also known as the Book of Revelation. And indeed there is a tension, a fundamental difference between the traditional apocalyptic paradigm and its contemporary articulations, such as the one I went through a few moments ago. So when we speak of apocalypse now, we are referring to a dystopian event, something undesirable, frightening. But such a predominant dystopian undertone is not present in the etymological meaning of the term apocalypse and in traditional apocalyptic revelations. 
And we cannot truly understand the contemporary apocalyptic imagination, the relevance of this trope to contemporary society, if not as being in profound contrast with the traditional sense of apocalypse. And indeed, I will ultimately argue that contemporary post-apocalyptic narratives are a critique of the traditional apocalyptic paradigm and its conception of time. But so before discussing this idea and the contemporary apocalyptic imagination more broadly, I will briefly examine the traditional apocalyptic paradigm in its religious articulations. So the painting on the slide shows John, the author of the book of Revelation, receiving his revelation from uh, an angel on the island of Patmos. And what is revealed to John? Well, first of all, catastrophes and the end of the world are revealed, which is why from Revelation the term apocalypse comes now to take on its contemporary meaning of catastrophe. So on the slide you can see a pictorial representation of an episode of the book of Revelation, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And these horsemen are usually interpreted as representing war, famine, death, conquest which together with a series of other disasters bring about the end of the material world. But more fundamentally, religious apocalyptic texts reveal a transcendent new utopian beginning, which in the book of Revelation is the divine kingdom of the New Jerusalem on the slide. So you can see John receiving this revelation of the heavenly city of the New Jerusalem. And it is this, the revelation of a better world, rather than catastrophic events, which is the very core of traditional apocalyptic narratives. So traditional apocalyptic writings flourish at times of crisis as comforting narratives, strange as that might sound to our contemporary ears. The book of Revelation, for instance, was written during the persecutions of Christians in the first century AD, and the revelation of the imminent advent of the New Jerusalem was supposed to comfort the persecuted believers, as it disclosed that God had a plan for humankind and that in the end everything would be made right. So traditional apocalyptic narratives are means by which to understand the world and one's place in it. These narratives create an organizing principle imposed on an overwhelming, seemingly disordered universe. So in other words, they basically impose an order at a time of disorder, a time of crisis. More specifically, they create a temporal, historical order that makes sense of time. So these narratives reveal that the whole course of human history is tending towards a final resolution, an end, which will make sense of everything that happened before including the crisis in which these texts are written. So once again, the end is central to traditional apocalyptic logic, but the end of the world as we know it is of a peculiar kind because it paves the way for a radical utopian renewal. So as Samora points out, while it is true that an acute sense of temporal disruption and disequilibrium is the source of and is always integral to apocalyptic thinking and narration, so is the conviction that historical crisis will have the cleansing effect of radical renewal. So catastrophes, disasters, these are all part of traditional apocalyptic narratives, but what is more important is that these dystopian events always lead to a better world, to radical utopian renewal. So the end of the world is not really the end of the world, but a new beginning. And it is because the end of apocalyptic history consists in the goal of a utopian new beginning and not merely in a cataclysmic end that apocalyptic narratives are able to make sense of time at a time of crisis and so to comfort people. So apocalypse is traditionally what we can think of as a teleological conception of time because time and history are understood as linear and as moving towards a future telos, a future end of time and of the material world, which is also a utopian aim, the New Jerusalem. So this apocalyptic conception of time and history as teleological, as a line directed towards betterment, is not only central to religious narratives, but is actually key to modernity and to its secular understanding of time and history. Oops. 
Oh. So scholars have argued that apocalyptic logic in its attempt to make sense of time lies at the origins of the concept of history. And this same logic underlines modern revolutionary movements from the American to the French to the Russian, because this faith in an advent of a new and better world after the violent cleansing of the revolution is intrinsically apocalyptic. And apocalyptic logic is also at the core of this idea of progress, which is obviously the driving force of modernity, because history in the ideology of progress is a line tending towards betterment just as in the traditional apocalyptic paradigm. And we could say that progress is a secular version of the traditional apocalyptic paradigm, because the utopian aim of progress is not a divine kingdom, but a perfect society realized through human means. So the apocalypse, this traditional um, story of a revelation of a utopian teleology, is not only a religious story, but a very important way to make sense of time in the Western world. But obviously, contemporary post-apocalyptic narratives are predominantly now about dystopian catastrophes followed by equally dystopian aftermaths, which is reflected in this meaning of the term apocalypse in the contemporary. So there is no utopia after the end, no sense of a historical progress towards a better world in these narratives. And so a story which was once grounded in hope about the future has become instead a reflection of fears and disillusionment about the present. A bleak shift in emphasis, Rosen says, from the belief in an ordered universe with a cogent history to one in which the overriding sense is of a chaotic, indifferent, and possibly, possibly meaningless universe. So what I will do now is to think a bit more about this point, um, contemporary apocalypse as expressing fears and disillusionment about the present. So about post-apocalyptic narratives as cautionary tales, tales which warn us about the dangers of our civilization. And to do so, because my key argument um, is that the apocalypse, both in the traditional sense and in the contemporary sense, is fundamentally concerned with time, I will discuss the clock which perfectly embodies the contemporary sense of apocalypse, and this is the doomsday clock. So this is a design of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and it was born in 1947, at a time where the greatest danger to humanity came from nuclear weapons in particular from the prospect that the United States and the Soviet Union were headed for a nuclear arms race. And so in its inception, the clock symbolizes the urgency of the nuclear dangers that the scientific community are trying to communicate to the public and to political leaders around the world. The design conveys how close we are to destroying ourselves. We are currently at three minutes to midnight where midnight is patently enough the apocalypse. And it's very significant to note that the logo of the clock only depicts the quarter of the clock itself, so the quarter which is closer to midnight. And indeed, ever since its creation in 1947, the hands of the clock have never been too far away from midnight, thus signifying this apocalyptic anxiety which has been thriving throughout these decades an apocalyptic anxiety which is obviously reflected in narratives of the period. But apocalypse, as expressed in the countdown of the doomsday clock, is a catastrophe, obviously, not a revelation. And the clock embodies how this shift in meaning uh, in the term of apocalypse also signifies a different conception of time. So the shift from a utopian teleology to a negative dystopian teleology. So time in the doomsday clock does not tend towards a completion which ushers in a new and better world order, a completion which makes sense of everything that happened before, as in the traditional sense of apocalypse. Rather, the doomsday clock is an embodiment of the contemporary sense of apocalypse, because time tends towards devastation and destruction. So the clock started at seven minutes to midnight in 1947, and reflecting various historical events has moved back and forth. The farthest the clock has been to midnight was in 1991, and this was 17 minutes to midnight. 1991 was the official end of the Cold War, and the United States and Russia 
were beginning to make deep cuts to their nuclear arsenals. The closest, on the other hand, the clock has been to midnight, was 1953, and this was two minutes from mid to midnight. And 1953 saw the test of the hydrogen bomb, a weapon far more powerful than any atomic bomb. So now, in 2016, according to the atomic scientists at the University of Chicago, we're basically at a level of danger which is very similar to the one in which we were when the H-bomb was tested. I'm just going to leave it here. So, obviously the situation is different. Nuclear weapons may not play such a huge role in contemporary fears. And indeed, if the clock, uh, if the clock sends moved base upon whether events push humanity closer or farther from nuclear apocalypse, the clock in 2007 began to include existential threats beyond nuclear weapons. So more specifically, climate change and dangers posed by rapid developments in the life sciences and other emerging technologies. So we're talking about risks associated with biotechnologies and cyber technologies. So this idea signaled by the clock that our existence is threatened, and this is a quote from the bulletin, by dangerous technologies of our own making, frames the idea that the contemporary sense of apocalypse as catastrophe is linked to human mistakes. So the apocalyptic catastrophe in the contemporary popular imagination is something humankind brings on itself, as the statement on the slide does. And this takes me to the concept of risk society. So Ulrich Beck defines contemporary society as a risk society in the sense that it is increasingly occupied with debating, preventing, and managing risks that it itself has produced. And we're talking about global warming, environmental degradation, reactor meltdowns, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, economic crisis, terrorism, so a never-growing list of contemporary risks. And the idea of risk society theorists is that basically modernity has produced these risks. So society, humankind, has produced these risks as part of the process of modernization. So once again, we are the stickman on the slide who moves the ends of the doomsday clock forward. And so the doomsday clock can be seen as embodying the preoccupation with the dangers of the contemporary race society. So what about contemporary post-apocalyptic fiction? How does it come into this? So if we consider that apocalyptic writings, ever since their religious origins, flourish at times of crisis, and that the present has been qualified as an unprecedented moment of risk, as a risk society, we could conceive contemporary post-apocalyptic fiction as the product of a risk society. So we could think of these fictions as reflecting the fears and anxieties derived from the escalation of risks, and as one of the strategies that this society deploys to anticipate possible catastrophes, to visualize them, to make them tangible, and so to better manage these risks. So we can think of contemporary post-apocalyptic fictions as serving a didactic function, as cautionary tales. So I think that this strategy, which I'm going to um, use in a moment, is quite productive, but there is also a problem with it, and I will return to this problem um, later in the talk. But for now, I will use the risks taken into account by the doomsday clock as a sort of guide to explore the contemporary apocalyptic imagination. So, oops, sorry. As the British novelist Will Self puts it, each generation gets the end of the world anxiety it deserves. He used to be transcendental, then it became elemental, and now it's environmental. So if we think back to the doomsday clock, which started um, as a warning against nuclear weapons, post-apocalyptic texts of the time reflected this anxiety. So nuclear post-apocalyptic texts flourished throughout the Cold War. So the passage quoted on the slide comes from Will Self's introduction to one of the best post-apocalyptic texts of the Cold War era, Ridley Walker by American author Russell Oban, published in 1980. So the novel is set about two millennia after a major nuclear war completely destroys civilization. And in the narrative, humankind is thus back 
to the Iron Age. So the most fascinating feature of the novel, of the novel is that Oban uses a post-apocalyptic language throughout the story, a post-apocalyptic English. Urban realizes that with the collapse of civilization, inevitably comes the collapse of language, something which is reflected in Self's own post-apocalyptic novel, The Book of Dave, published in 2006, which also deploys a post-apocalyptic English. And once again, to, back, to go back to the fears embodied by the doomsday clock and to use them as a guide to the contemporary apocalyptic imagination, I discussed how the clock in 2007 started taking into account environmental dangers. And indeed, the Book of Dave depicts a post-apocalyptic world, which is the result of current environmental concerns. So the post-apocalyptic sections of the Book of Dave are set in a future United Kingdom profoundly altered by rising seawater levels. So the UK now consists of a group of islands, the Ing Archipelago. And because of this major catastrophe, civilization is regressed to the Middle Ages. And so this environmental anxiety um, explored by the Book of Dave is at the very core of, con of the contemporary risk society, as suggested by the notion of the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is a new geological epoch, the epoch in which we are now living, where human activity has such a powerful and disastrous impact on the planet that it leaves a long-term signature in the strata record. So the image on the slide illustrates some of the human activities that are having such a profound impact, from intensive agriculture to pollution, from overpopulation to toxic waste. Now, obviously, apocalypse, as we have already seen in the Book of Dave, is a trope that can work really well to explore the critical impact on the planet of a human presence. And indeed, Lawrence Buell argues that apocalypse is the single most powerful metaphor that the contemporary environmental imagination has at its disposal. So similarly to the notion of risk society, if we read contemporary post-apocalyptic fiction, through the prism of the Anthropocene, we connect these texts to the socio-political historical conjuncture in which they are written, so we read them as cautionary tales. And a good example um, is Cormac McCarthy's The Road, published in 2006, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2007 and was then turned into a movie in 2009. And the road has been described by activist and writer George Monbiot as the most important environmental book ever written. So McCarthy depicts the journey of an unnamed father and son in a very bleak post-apocalyptic America. We don't know what caused the apocalypse, but the catastrophe has left the world a dying wasteland. And what makes the book such an important environmental text is that the depictions of the road's depleted biosphere never provide the reader with any hope that the ecosystem can regenerate. We read that everything is dead to the root, the trees are charred and limbless because of the fires that followed the unspecified catastrophe, and you can see that on the slide. The whole country is burned away. Uh, animals appears to be, appear to be nearly extinct, and the only living animal the two protagonists meet is a dog. And to further this dystopian depiction, McCarthy uses an almost monochromatic palette in his descriptions of the post-apocalyptic world, something which the movie reflects quite closely, as you can see from the still on the slide. So black and grey dominate the post-apocalyptic scenario. Nature has become devoid of its colours, the sea is not blue anymore, but it's grey. The snow turns black because of the omnipresent ash. And even the light is almost oxymoronically grey. Indeed, the wasteland is characterised by an encroaching darkness with, quote, nights dark beyond darkness and the days more grey each one than what had gone before. So if you think about what I was saying uh, about the traditional conception of apocalypse, where catastrophe is followed by a radical utopian renewal, the road is the absolute opposite of this conception. What follows the unspecified apocalypse is an absolute dystopia. 
As Monbiot observes, McCarthy's thought experiment exposes the one terrible fact to which our technological hubris blinds us. Our dependence on biological production remains absolute. Civilization is just a russeting on the skin of the biosphere, never immune from being wrapped against the sleeve of environmental change. And indeed, what happens in McCarthy's novel as a result of the death of the biosphere is a complete collapse of civilization. In the Rhodes Wasteland, the government and all of its infrastructures have collapsed. Mankind is back to the basics of mere survival and is reduced to scavenging for food amidst the ruins of the pre-apocalyptic world. The only sustenance available are the remains of our world. So canned food, for instance, and some people, the bad guys on the slide, even resort to cannibalism. So the road reminds us that our dependence on biological production on the biosphere remains absolute. So without the biosphere, the novel suggests, there can be no civilization. And so you can see how, why this has been described as such an important environmental text. So we can interpret it as a cautionary tale in relation to current environmental concerns and the Anthropocene. But to go back to the doomsday clock, so our guide in the exploration of the contemporary apocalyptic imagination, I mentioned how in 2007, in addition to environmental risks, the clock began to take into account the risks associated with biotechnologies. So Margaret Atwood's trilogy, Oryx and Craig, The Year of the Flood, and Mad Adam, published between 2003 and 2013, explores both our current concerns about the environment, as well as developments in the life sciences. So the trilogy revolves around a human-developed global epidemic, which almost annihilates mankind. But even before this apocalyptic event takes place, climate change has already made some areas of the USA, where the novel is set, uninhabitable. The central subject of the trilogy is the abuse of technology. So Atwood, a Canadian author, sees the present as approaching an apocalyptic ending precisely because of the role technology plays in our society. So on the one hand, voicing environmental concerns, the novel makes clear that unrestrained exploitation of resources and pollution have led to global warming. So entire areas of the planet have been swept away by floods and other catastrophes. Climate change has of course also worsened the inequalities between the global north and south and has caused the extinction of several animal species. But on the other hand, it is a scientist that actually engineers the deadly virus. Craig, this is the name of the scientist, recognizes the environmental problems mankind faces, but he chooses to solve them in quite a radical way. So he engineers a plague which should completely destroy humankind and builds our post-human replacement, the Krakers. And obviously the name Krakers, from the name of the scientist, indicates the trope of the megalomaniac scientist who is playing God. So the post-human Krakers are genetically programmed by Krake so as to never fall into the mistakes that have led humans to the environmental crisis. The Krakers are vegetarian, their reproduction is genetically regulated, they die young so as to prevent overpopulation, they produce little waste and they actually even re-eat their own feces, they lack neural complexes for hierarchy, thus eliminating violence and war, and they cannot recognize skin color so that racism cannot exist. And besides the Krakers, the novels are full of depictions of various other genetically modified beings. So the pre-apocalyptic world of the trilogy is the reign of gene splicing, where everything is altered and alterable through the process of hybridization. And this is reflected um, on the images on the covers. So on the Madadam's cover, you can see the pigoons, pigs that contain human organs, and on the Year of the Floods cover, the mohair sheep, which grow colorful hair, which are then used by women as wigs. But Aquid is also warning us against the rising power of corporations. In the scenarios she depicts, panoptic corporations rule the world and scientific elites are virtually without any control. 
As long as they present their research as lucrative, as Craig does, the corporations give them free hand. Craig indeed lies on the true nature of the pill responsible for spreading the deadly virus. The pills were presented as being sexually enhancing, youth prolonging, and as offering protections against STDs. So obviously something which was going to be a huge success in terms of sales. And similar concerns about the environment and the rising power of corporations are expressed in The Stone Gods by British author Jeanette Winterson, published in 2007. So as Winterson explains on her website, she believes our time to be an apocalyptic time. As she writes, either we face our environmental challenges now or many of us will perish and much of what we cherish in our civilization will be destroyed. She thus conceives of a book as a prompt to do something about this situation, since, she writes, I am sure that change of any kind starts in the self, not in the state. And I am sure that when we challenge ourselves imaginatively, we then use that challenge in our lives. So the stone gods consists of four different narrative strands, all set in worlds going through apocalyptic times. So the first section is set in a futuristic civilization on Orbis, a dying planet which appears to have found its chance for a new beginning in planet blue. The second section takes place in the 18th century on Easter Island at a time when the very last tree is destroyed. So once again, a time of environmental crisis. And the third and fourth strands both develop in Tech City, run by more corporation in a very near future after a nuclear war. And more corporation plays quite an important part in enhancing the dystopian atmosphere of this very complex plot. So for instance, it turns out that Moore's plan is to leave the poor to die on the soon to be uninhabitable Orbis and to transport to Planet Blue only those who can afford it, creating an elitist corporate state on the new planet. And obviously the name of the corporation itself is significant, more. It denotes an inquenchable consumerist desire for more, a desire which has obviously led Orbis to the environmental collapse. So more, the corporation, ironically leads to decline and less and risks effacing the very possibility of a future for mankind. But as I was saying, I believe that there's a problem with reading these novels simply as reflecting the conjuncture in which they are written, as reflecting current anxieties framed by the concepts of risk society and the Anthropocene. Of course, the context in which these texts are written play a role, um, as the quotation on the slide from Janet Winterson exemplifies. But these accounts that link these texts solely to their context tend to ignore the history of the apocalyptic paradigm, which is the history that I traced at the beginning of this talk. This is a history which is intertwined with a certain conception of time. Time is teleological, time as linear, as directed towards betterment, towards utopia. And so in the final part of this talk, I will give you my own argument about what is at stake in the contemporary apocalyptic imagination. So I mentioned many times throughout the talk how there is a profound contrast between the contemporary and the traditional sense of apocalypse. Traditional apocalyptic writings flourish at times of crisis to make sense of the crisis through the revelation of a future utopia. But this is exactly what is not happening in the contemporary. Ours is a time of crisis, but the apocalyptic texts that we get do not make sense of this time through the revelation of a future utopia. Rather, these are dystopian texts. And so I believe that contemporary post-apocalyptic narratives are a critique of the traditional apocalyptic paradigm and its conception of time and history. These fictions expose the apocalyptic conception of time, which as I have discussed is not just a religious story, but is also a story which is at the very core of the Western understanding of time. Well, this understanding is exposed as just a narrative. And in particular, these narratives critique the ideology of progress, not simply in the sense that they make us aware of the risks of progress, but rather in the sense that they really challenge 
the foundations of this ideology in traditional apocalyptic logic. So you might remember that I mentioned how in Ridley Walker, this typical text of the Cold War, after the nuclear holocaust, society is back to the Iron Age. And the same goes for the more recent The Book of Day, where society, after the disastrous consequences of global warming, is back to the Middle Ages. So this return to a past stage of human civilization after the apocalyptic catastrophe is a trope of post-apocalyptic fiction. And we can think about it as a temporal inversion. So literally, the future is a return to the past. And we find temporal inversion in the road, for instance, with the reversion to savagery and the cannibalism of the bad guys. But we also find the same trope in the stone gods, although the novel takes a more ironical approach to it. Because of progress, human beings are literally regressing in the world of the stone gods. Their brains are shrinking because, Winterson writes, people have no need for brains in the corporate world of Orbis, where everything is geared towards consumption. So through their dystopian post-apocalyptic scenarios and through this trope of temporal inversion, these narratives subvert this ideology of progress and its conception of time as a line tending towards betterment. But the Stone Gods also frames another important aspect of this critique of the apocalyptic conception of time in contemporary post-apocalyptic fiction. Rather than representing a linear history in the novel's four different strands, Winterson represents a cyclical history, where human beings keep repeating the same mistakes, colonizing and devastating planet after planet. So the quotation on the slide refers to Planet Blue, which is presented originally as the chance to begin in a new world after Orbis's environmental crisis, but which is really no such thing. It is just, Winterson writes, a memory of a new world, with the universe being a memory of human mistakes. Indeed, it is later revealed to the reader that Planet Blue is Earth. So Orbis, which is the planet in which the novel opens and which seems to be this great futuristic society, is actually the planet humankind colonizes and destroys before Earth. And obviously, given current concerns regarding climate change in the reader's world, it is clear that Winterson's suggestion is that Earth, so Planet Blue in the world of the novel, is added towards the same cataclysmic end as Orbis and many other planets before it. So this cyclical history challenges, once again, this idea of history as a line, as a teleological line tending towards betterment, which is so central to apocalyptic logic. And the same goes for another interesting text, which is Cloud Atlas by British novelist um, David Mitchell, published in 2004, and then turned into a movie by the Wachowskis in 2012. So the novel is once again quite complex. It's divided into six narrative strands set in different times from the 19th century to a distant post-apocalyptic future. And the peculiarity of Cloud Atlas is that all these stories, with the exception of the sixth, which is situated in the middle, the post-apocalyptic narrative, are interrupted in order to give way to the following one and are then resumed in reverse order in the second half of the book. So the book opens and closes with the same narrative, but then these narratives are continuously interrupted. And the book itself theorizes this narrative structure as a different model of time from the teleological linear conception um, of, the apocalyptic log of apocalyptic logic. So rather than as an arrow, which is a teleological image because arrows are directed towards a target, in Cloud Atlas time is described as a boomerang or as a matryoshka. And the already discussed The Book of Dave also complicates the apocalyptic temporal linearity by alternating between what is more or less the present and the post-apocalyptic Ing archipelago. And so it is on this novel that I would like to conclude the lecture because it perfectly exemplifies this subversion of the traditional apocalyptic paradigm that I posit underlines post-apocalyptic fiction. So the subtitle of the novel is A Revelation of the Recent Past and the Distant Future. And this subtitle, A Revelation, unmistakably assigns the Book of Dave 
to the genre of apocalyptic writings, but with a parodic intent. Because Self's novel tells the story of a cab driver in present-day London, Dave Rudman, who, after the divorce from his wife, has a nervous breakdown, writes a book to his estranged son, and buries it in Hampstead. And this book contains Dave's revelation, but obviously it's a revelation that is the result of the cab driver's breakdown. So Dave's revelatory book consists in the knowledge of the city of London, so basically a map of London, and an allegedly divine law which structures life in order to minimize women's power over children and ends over men. But centuries later, after global warming and the consequent rise in seawater levels have inundated most of Britain, Dave's book is found and is mistaken for a sacred text. So Self's parodic critique is directed at showing how the apocalyptic construction of history often ends up legitimizing those in power. Dave's crazed revelation of a future society based on his law is exploited by the post-apocalyptic priestly hierarchy to justify its extremely oppressive power, especially over women. So apocalyptic logic, which traditionally was born to create order at a time of disorder through utopian revelations, which traditionally is about comforting people, now ends up sustaining and legitimizing in self-parody a profoundly dystopian society. And so perfectly embodying the critical tension between the traditional and the contemporary apocalyptic imagination, apocalyptic logic is exposed in the Book of Dave as a narrative particularly congenial for a modern psychotic nightmare. Thank you. I think we'll all agree that was a fascinating talk. Uh, we do have a few moments spare for questions. Yeah. Could you say something about the idea of rapture? Mm. That, that seems to have had some influence in politics and to be held by people who you would consider normal, but who are, almost, I mean, who are quite prominent. Um, could you talk about that? that it's also trapped. Transcendental, which you said, uh, the idea of yeah. the move from being transcendental to environmental, and it doesn't seem to fit that pattern. Yeah, I mean, rapture is actually something that doesn't really um, appear in these narratives. It's something that is completely absent, except for some re contemporary religious takes on the apocalyptic narrative, such as the Left Behind series, which is quite a fundamentalist um, uh, series on. Um, apocalyptic logic. Um, but what you were saying at the beginning, the idea that rapture is then taken up by politics and by contemporary politics is something quite interesting. Uh, because even if you don't necessarily think about rapture, but you think about something that is not that immediately obvious um, apocalyptic, so the distinction between what is good or bad and this absolute dichotomy between the evil and the good, this is also quite apocalyptic because obviously every time that you think through these dichotomies you're also thinking about yourself as the one who is obviously in the right and as the one that will then be saving the world. And these kind of dichotomies are obviously very prominent in politics today, it's how it works basically, it's by having these very um, clear cut divisions which are obviously not tenable that people then get the vote. So, <laughs> yeah, we do. Other questions? Yes. Can you talk about like different branches, you know, of apocalyptic visions? Like, which one do you either have the most interest in or deem the most divisive? Um, I mean, as you might have guessed by my two final texts, so both Cloud Atlas and um, Winters and the Stone Gods, I find very interesting these apocalyptic narratives that play a lot with narrative structure. So I'm very interested in complex plots. Um, even beyond apocalyptic narratives, this is what I'm interested in in contemporary fiction, because I think that they do interesting things with time and with the way in which they conceptualize history. Um, and I think that it's quite interesting to be thinking about these kind of um, weird narrative structures and what they might signify and how we could interpret them. So. Sorry, say that again? Of course, yeah, if you want to, absolutely, yeah, I'd be happy to, yeah. <laughs> David. 
I was going to ask, do you, is there any sort of national trends with this? Do British authors have no. different stories? Or <laughs> no. does it, it very deliberately sort of try and disengage from that? Well, I mean, I mean, in, in some ways there is, in the sense that, for instance, if you think about the Book of Dave, it's obviously very uh, clearly set in London. Um, you know, there's a London cab driver who talks about a knowledge, and um, the book itself, it's written in a post-apocalyptic English in the post-apocalyptic sections, which is actually some sort of um, variation of Cockney, basically. So that's how you get to the post-apocalyptic English. And so in that sense, it's very regional. But in terms of concerns, um, no. Like obviously, you know, the risks that I talked about are global risks, and so the way in which all these narratives approach um, these risks and the various apocalyptic scenarios are quite global. It's quite interesting that a lot of these texts are set in the U.S., even though the authors are not from the U.S. or even from Canada. Um, many texts, uh, like for instance, Jim Crace's *The Pest House*, a British novelist, is set in the U.S. Um, yeah, all the students are laughing because you know you're the first ones that are going according to these texts. Um, but um, yes, so there is definitely that kind of um, very American trend. <laughs> yeah. Just quick, is there any particular reason why there would be this focus on the United States as opposed to any other particular region mm. of the world? Yeah. Well, why would you look at the, uh, the Americans and go? Well, um, well, part of the reasons I think is that. Apocalyptic logic is actually quite central to the development of the American nation. So if you think about the myth of the city upon a hill, that's basically the New Jerusalem, and it's kind of the founding myth of America. Uh, American exceptionalism and manifest destiny are both apocalyptic ideologies. Um, so the nation has a very, very close connection to traditional apocalyptic logic. So if, as I argue, these texts are trying to subvert and critique that, kind of logic, then obviously you said these texts in America. Yeah. <laughs> I believe you had a question. Oh, oh yes. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you see uh, authors using post-apocalyptic as kind of a way to take on uh, difficult, perhaps, political subjects. Uh, I, I guess I'm thinking of Orwell, like, with mm -hmm. or could be read as just a critique of Stalinism or, yeah. you know, and do you see perhaps with the political shifts in the world, we won't go into detail, but <laughs> uh, do you see perhaps more of that kind of post yeah, perhaps. I mean, it would be interesting to see what happens and what kind of um, develop. Obviously, like totalitarian society are still explored in these novels. Like, it's not just Orwell, but obviously, as I was saying, the Book of Dave is a lot about a totalitarian society, although obviously a parodic one. But that doesn't mean that it's not scary. It's quite scary, actually, and it's being completely nonsensical. Um, but yes, it would be interesting to see what you know, what kind of apocalyptic texts we get now. I mean, there was an article in the New York Times, I believe, that was talking about how um, literature might talk about the Trump phenomenon and whether there was already a Trump um, novel out there. So it would be interesting to see that. See that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Was there a particular like age or maybe generation where apocalyptic went from meaning something that was a rebirth sort of mm. and a coming of a new age as opposed to just yeah, I mean, so if you think about romanticism, for instance, which we've talked about in class, hello, um, <laughs> there was a lot of, um, you know, traditional um, kind of um, apocalyptic imagery. So there, there was still uh, Blake, for instance, which one, uh, who once again we discussed in class, had this traditional understanding of apocalypse in many ways. Then as you move on, I mean, the kind of um, scholarly consensus is that obviously with World War II especially, and obviously the Holocaust and um, you know, various other concentration camps, uh, that kind of narrative of you know, the Western world as bringing about rebirth and uh, regeneration is not tenable anymore. And so these steps begin to get darker and darker. Hmm. So I, I know. Think that 
mean, but are they really different though? Like, in the sense that, you know, they, they are still quite dark. Obviously you get the positive hero or heroine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the world itself is about a rebirth. So as long as you have this kind of very dystopian core, then I don't really see that many differences. I think we're done on questions and a very round, good round of applause. Thank you.